Good evening, everyone. My name is, uh, my name is Jonathan Crystal. I'm the Vice Provost here at Fordham, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2020 Fordham Distinguished Lecture on Disability. Let me start with an access note. There are ASL interpreters for this event. You can pin their videos to keep them on the screen. To access the captions, click on the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. This event is organized by the Fordham Faculty Working Group on Disability, a university-wide group supported by the Provost's Office. This year's event was also made possible through the support of Fordham's Chief Diversity Officer, Rafael Zapata, the Gabelli School of Business, the Graduate School of Education, the Graduate School of Social Service, the School of Law, the Economics Department, and the English Department. The Fordham's Distinguished Lecture on Disability series is now in its fifth year. It is part of two major initiatives on disability at Fordham, the Disability Studies Minor and the Research Consortium on Disability. The Minor offers students an interdisciplinary way to engage with questions about the meanings and experiences of disability through coursework, on-campus events, and participation in the broader disability studies community in New York City. The Research Consortium on Disability, RCD, coordinates and supports disability-related research at Fordham University to help guide the world on a path towards inclusion. The people in the consortium are social scientists and scholars in the humanities, in business, education, law, and social services doing research in disability studies and in disability and health-related fields. Its next major event will be an online symposium on social policy on November 12th and 13th. Students at Fordham are also organizing in clubs to advocate for students with disabilities. For information on these efforts, as well as on the minor in disability studies and the research consortium on disability, please email rcd at fordham.edu. Turning to this evening's activities, tonight's event will take place in two parts. The lecture will follow an interview format and it will be followed by a Q&A with the audience through the Q&A chat box. The interview and the Q&A will be moderated by Navina Chaitu. Navina holds a BA in Economics and Political Science from Fordham University, magna cum laude. She also has an MS in Public Policy and Management from Carnegie Mellon University where she was a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellow. Navina is a research manager at the New York City's Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, where she is responsible for the behavioral health research portfolio. Before this, she was a research analyst at the Vera Institute of Justice, where she was staffed to the Independent Commission on New York City Criminal Justice and Incarceration Reform, and helped develop a blueprint to close the jails on Rikers Island. Navina is currently pursuing her PhD in criminal justice from the CUNY Graduate Center, John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Now, let me introduce our distinguished presenter. We are thrilled to have Judy Human here with us this evening. Judy Human is a lifelong advocate and an internationally recognized leader in the disability rights community. Judy has a long and distinguished career and I will only highlight some of her many achievements. Judy was a founding member, member of the Berkeley Center for Independent Living, which was the first of its kind in the United States and helped to launch the independent living movement, both nationally and globally. Judy served in the Clinton administration as the assistant secretary for the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services in the Department of Education. She also served as the World Bank's first advisor on disability and development from 2002 to 2006. In this position, she worked with governments and civil society in the global south on including disability in policy. President Obama appointed Judy as the first special advisor for international disability rights at the US Department of State from 2010 to 2017. Recently, as a senior fellow at the Ford Foundation, she worked to help advance the inclusion of disabled people in the media. Throughout her life, Judy has traveled on her motorized wheelchair to countries on every continent, 
in urban and rural communities alike. She has played a role in the development and implementation of major legislation, including the IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, Section 504, that prohibits discrimination based on disability, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and the Convention on the Right, and the Convention of per Rights on Persons with Disabilities. She is part of a recent film called Crip Camp. It shares the story of disabled teens at camp in the 1970s and how they helped spark the disability civil rights movement. The film is available for free on YouTube. Her memoir, being Human, an unrep Unrepentant Memoir of a Disability Rights Activist, came out in February this year. Please join me in welcoming Judy Human to Fordham University. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I really look forward to this discussion, and I am an extrovert and so very sorry that I'm not with all of you now, but I want to really thank Sophie Mitra for her resilience in getting what originally was supposed to be my being on campus and being able to move this virtually. And thank you, Jonathan, for your comments. And Navina, take it away. Thank you so much, Judy. It's so lovely to be with you as always. And I'm so grateful to Fordham for inviting me to come out here and spend this time with you. Um, I'm also sorry we can't be in person because your personality just lights up the room and I know that everyone at Fordham would just get a huge joy out of it as well all of us. Um, I know some of you are joining us from the previous event, but I just wanted to get started with setting the stage with a little bit of um, what brings, what makes Judy who she is. Um, and so the first question I have for her is, was there a particular moment or a series of events that led you to become the disability rights activist that you are today? Thank you very much for the question. Um, you know, I, I had polio in 1949 when I was in Brooklyn. And certainly at 18 months old, I wasn't thinking about becoming a disability rights anything. And um, I like many of you um, who are listening, it's as you get older and are experiencing injustices that even when I was experiencing them in the beginning, I didn't have a word for it. It was really um, over time recognizing that I wasn't being treated equally. And that really started when I was five years old and my mother took me to the neighborhood school, which was about four or five blocks away, pulled me up to register me for school and was told by the principal that I couldn't attend the school because I was a fire hazard. Now at five years old, was that like, okay, I'm making my poster and going out and demonstrating? Of course not. And my mother and father who uh, were German Jewish refugees, they'd come over in the thirties and my dad was in the Marines and they'd met in 1945. They lost a good number of family members in the Holocaust. You know, they had never thought about having a disabled child. So, you know, they basically um, made a decision that while a doctor recommended that I be put in an institution, that they weren't going to do that and that they would just, you know, proceed with my life. So. I was the oldest of three kids. My mom takes me to school to register me, and then is told no. And so really didn't know other parents um, who had kids with disabilities and what to do with that, no. And um, it took about three and a half years before I finally did get to go into a regular public school, but only special ed classes. And that window for the first, second, third and a half of the fourth grade I had a teacher being sent by the Board of Ed for a total of two and a half hours a week. So that's really over time when I was beginning to realize that there were very low expectations, not from my family, but from the system. And that like multiplied as I was getting older. And as I was getting older and meeting other disabled people in my special ed classes and then at camp, 
it was becoming, you know, very apparent that we were facing discrimination without any real group of people speaking up against discrimination. The backdrop at that time um, was television, which I think is very important to think about because television was letting me and millions of people look at the strengthening of the civil rights movement. So the Rosa Parks uh, bus boycott, uh, the March on Washington, um, the integration of schools in the South, and learning about what was going on in New York with uh, trying to deal with desegregate, desegregation um, and gentrification. And for me and my friends, we were really looking at that and recognizing the parallels. So I would say, you know, it was many different factors um, and really uh, recognizing that as disabled individuals, when we were young, when we were in college, for example, there were many universities that were beginning to set up disabled students' offices. I went to Long Island University in Brooklyn and we got a disabled student service office set up. And um, all of those things really we're pulling us together. We were looking at the anti-war movement, the women's movement, on and on. And we were really getting strength to recognize that we could not wait for other people to do things for us. Um, that the way people had been doing things for us was very much medical model. It was not rights-based model. And we didn't want to get into discussing cure. We wanted to get into quality education, the ability to move around the city in our communities, the ability to get jobs, get paid, live in the community, get married, have children. And I think, you know, it's one thing after another where we realized that we could make a difference if we did it ourselves. Thank you, Judy. And so you did make a difference, of course. Throughout your lifetime, you've played a pivotal role in the development and implementation of numerous pieces of legislation, including IDEA Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, ADA, and the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Can you tell us a little bit about each of those? And in particular, what was the motivating force behind them and ultimately what led to them being implemented? So, the motivating force, as I was saying, was our recognition that discrimination was not only occurring, but that we had to make a difference in fighting against it. Um, the Rehabilitation Act of 1972, as amended, was vetoed by then President Nixon. And when it was vetoed in 1972, um, I had been involved in setting up an organization in New York called Disabled in Action and uh, Disabled in Action and another group called Pride. And uh, people who had uh, Dr. Bill Bronston and uh, Malachi McCourt and his family and a number of other people who had uh, basically gotten Geraldo Rivera into Willowbrook um, and opened up the doors for people to see the atrocities, we, the three groups got together and decided that we were going to hold a demonstration outside of Nixon headquarters to protest the fact that um, he had vetoed the Rehab Act. Now in the Rehab Act, which ultimately got signed in 1973, there is something called Title V. And for those of you who are interested in disability history, um, you know, you need to go back and study this, but Title V included a number of provisions, 501, 502, 503, 504, 508, but um, 504 is the provision um, which makes it illegal for an entity receiving money from the federal government to discriminate against one based on disability. This was a very small provision, a potentially big impact, but it was like 42 words. When uh, there were demonstrations 
in New York, and then there were demonstrations in Washington, many, many organizations coming together in DC and marching and having a sleep out and going to the Hill. Um, that's when Nixon finally signed the law. But it took from 1973 until 1977. What happened in that window was disabled people began to understand what these important provisions under Title V were. Unlike the Americans with Disabilities Act and unlike the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which at that time was called EHA, where there'd been uh, many years of work in the case of IDEA, of parents and others fighting for this education legislation and for the ADA um, from like 1982 to 1990, um, this was a sleeper. And so it was very important that as what was then called the Health Education and Welfare began to look at this law and began to look at what needed to happen in the development of the regulation. So what was you know, essential at that point were things like, okay, what did it mean you couldn't discriminate against someone's disability? What was the definition of disability? So there was a lot of time spent on developing who was a disabled person. And there was a lot of time spent on, well, what was discrimination? What were remedies? Things like reasonable accommodations. Um, there were meetings that the Department of uh, Health, Education and Welfare traveled around the country to meet disabled people and others to learn more. And then this draft um, NPRM came out. Uh, basically, it was the draft of the 504 regulations. People from all over the country, um, universities, hospitals, any of the entities that were going to no longer be able to discriminate if they got money from the federal government and the disability community. We were having meetings, we were writing comments, and uh, the regulations were ready to be signed uh, during President Ford's office term, but he didn't sign them. Um, he felt there was too much and he didn't want to do it, so he didn't. And um, when President Carter was elected, he committed to signing these draft regulations, but then it wasn't happening. So disabled people were organizing under a group called the American Coalition of Citizens with Disabilities, which was a cross-disability group. And at that time, the chairperson was a woman named Eunice Fiorito who was blind and grew up in Chicago, but was the head of the mayor's office on disability under the Lindsay administration. And a guy named Frank uh, Bow was a deaf man who ultimately became a professor at Hofstra University. So all of this back work was going on. The decision was made by ACCD in February of 77, that if the regulations were not signed, there would be demonstrations. And we can talk more about that afterwards, but there were, and um, the San Francisco Bay Area where I had moved, we organized the demonstrations in the Bay Area, which lasted for 28 days at 150 people um, during the occupation. And ultimately the work that we did with ACCD resulted in the regulations being signed. Now, one of the important parts of the Section 504 regulations is that it was a cross-disability movement. Um, it was reasonably intergenerational, but it also included religious leaders. It included labor unions. It included the women's community, many other groups. And it was um, really the result of the work that the disability community in the Bay Area had been doing that we'd been supporting other movements and they were supporting us. This is a very critical factor, not only in looking at 504, but then moving forward. Because remember, the Civil Rights Act of 64 did not include disabled people. It covered the public and private sector. So 504 was um, going to cover um, money coming from the government, but it wasn't covering the private sector. So it took really um, until 1990 with many years of work on 
developing legislation, strengthening co coalition. And at this point, um, it was no longer a sleeper like 504. Um, it was very public and there were many groups um, that were opposing it, uh, the Chamber of Commerce and many others, um, because they felt that um, it was something that was unreasonable to be expecting. So again, the strengthening of the disability rights movement, the expansion of the cross disability uh, movement, bringing in labor unions, the leadership conference on civil rights, and many others, um, and, and all types of activities were what enabled congressional representatives and US senators to understand that the discrimination that disabled people were facing was not something that happened once in a while. It happened in every community, in every state, and it happened regularly. And what was important about being able to document that and how it was documented, a man by the name of Justin Dart, who was on the National Council on Disability, ultimately um, seen as the father of the Americans with Disabilities Act. He traveled to every state in the United States a number of times collecting diaries, getting disabled people to talk about the kinds of discrimination that they had experienced. And that made this much more compelling and ultimately resulted in the Congress after holding joint hearings, ultimately, and being pressured, ultimately, um, satis sorry, um, approving, voting for the Americans with Disabilities Act. Did I answer your question? <laughs> it definitely did. Um... And I think that it really is a great segue into the present and where we are currently. And so we've seen the impacts of COVID-19 and the COVID-19 pandemic nationally. And I've also seen some questions popping up from the audience and it's just, it was just at the right time in that someone in the audience asked a question that lined up with my next question, which is, how has the pandemic uniquely affected people with disabilities and their rights? And then uh, I think I'm going to read you the question from the audience because I think it's but really it tied after. into this. Can I do that? That's, you want to read it now? Okay. I think it's tied in. I'll okay. read it and you can choose it to address it later if you'd like. Um, due to the pandemic, special education requirements have been relaxed due to challenges with in-person education and accessible technology. Combined with the unique education needs of students with disabilities, what strategies would you recommend for improving this situation to ensure learning loss does not increase? So let me answer that and then if you could ask me the other question again. So okay. I think, um, first of all, at the federal level, there have been no, there has been no uh, weakening of the law or regulation. So I think that's very important. I think what's also very important is that we look at the fact that disabled and non-disabled children are also at this point not receiving the education that they were receiving and that discussions which are going on within the Board of Education at the city level and at the state level with the State Department of Education. Um, I hope that the voices of families and disabled individuals are meaningfully involved in those discussions because it is very clear that disabled children uh, are being adversely, very adversely impacted. Um, some students more than others, but um, students who have the need to use technology, which everyone does if they don't have the right technology, if they're not getting trained, if their family members don't know how to use it and they have multiple needs besides just the learning needs that occupational therapy, speech therapy, physical therapy, which can impede their ability to learn if they're not getting those supports. Um, the broader issue around COVID, and this is very much a part of it, 
is what are we doing to ensure that as things move forward, that issues affecting disabled people are not being left on the wayside. And so in the area of education, I think we're looking at compensatory education. We're looking at disabled children and others, but definitely disabled children, being able to get additional educational services to be able to try to catch up on what they've been losing. Um, and I think the voices of parents, the voices of adults, I think are also important. Disabled adults need to be playing a bigger role um, in looking at what is happening to kids with disabilities um, because we know that certain populations of disabled children are gonna be more adversely affected by others. Families who may have money who can be able to bring some support for their children versus families where parents are working and kids are not able to get the support they need and they don't have money to be able to provide additional services, those kids who are poor are, are gonna be more adversely affected. Um, so it is our responsibility as disabled adults, as people in special education, to really be working in a collaborative way to help ensure that uh, we do everything we can as we move out of COVID to ensure that children are getting the services that they need. Now, COVID more broadly, I think, you know, what, um, you know, I don't need to be telling you any of this. This is why I wish you were all together because we could have a discussion. But I mean, you certainly uh, see that the numbers of people dying in nursing homes and in congregate living programs um, where, many, many people in the disability community for decades have been fighting against nursing homes, fighting against segregated uh, living arrangements, um, not only because the quality of life for people is adversely affected in these uh, living situations, but also because we know that things like sexual violence against people in these segregated environments is higher. Um, and we know that people living in these segregated environments, as we very clearly see with COVID, are at a much greater risk and higher mortality rate um, because the, the virus is spreading more. The workers um, are not getting the appropriate, were not getting the appropriate PPE that they needed. And you know, this again was an out of sight, out of mind population. If we in fact had the amount of money that needs to be provided so that people never had to go live in these places, but were able to stay in their homes, in their communities, um, with ex in accessible environments, with appropriate supports, the death rate of disabled people would have been much lower. And we also see that poverty is definitely a link to um, people contracting the virus and, virus and then are at higher risk of dying from the virus. Uh, the media calls it underlying conditions. We call it disability. You know, people who have diabetes, um, people who have hypertension and various other um, disabilities that adversely affect them and put them at greater risk. Uh, we need to talk about this in a, in a continued ramped up way. Um, I, I certainly think that in New York, many people have been talking about this for a long time, have been working really hard, um, but I'm concerned that what we're seeing in the budget from Governor Cuomo is also reducing money for home and community-based services. So I think we have to be very aware of the fact that things could be getting worse instead of getting better. And by that, I mean, less money for people living in the community will put more people at risk of winding up in institutions. And I guess the other thing to really mention is the whole issue of employment and um, the changing world of work as a result of COVID and as a result of the fact that the world and work is changing, was changing pre-COVID, but needing to make sure that as the city um, is 
looking at its future both for city employees and em and employer sorry the city as an employer and the private sector as employers as disabled individuals we really need to be paying attention and getting involved in what are the changes that are going to be going on in the world of work what kinds of training will people need for the jobs of today and tomorrow are we getting what we need and i guess for me another important issue is um, i very much understand that it's been amazing that we've been able to do so much online but i think for many disabled people doing everything online is very difficult just like we were discussing with kids it's also difficult for people with various disabilities if they don't have the right technology if they don't have the right supports and i really want to make sure that the general population and employers don't think that the panacea is for disabled people all working at home um, it's appropriate for some disabled people to work at home just like for some non-disabled people what we have learned in COVID is that businesses are able to do things that they said they couldn't do before, and that's a positive. But at the end of the day, we don't want to be isolated in our homes just because we have a disability. That's a great insight. Thank you. Um, going beyond COVID and thinking about the future what challenges beyond housing, employment, and the institutionalization um, do you still see facing people with disabilities? And also, what gives you the greatest hope for this population? I think the greatest hope is clearly what we're seeing um, with the continued evolution and growth of the disability rights movement. Um, disability study minors, disability majors, disabled students and faculty, and people who are not, you know, in universities, um, recognizing that we are an empowered group of people. And uh, the disabled Black Lives Matter movement um, and other movements where people of color with disabilities are coming together and really speaking up and out, I think our movement is really diversifying. Now, in saying that, I still see and believe that the vast majority of disabled people in the United States don't know they have a disability where they're protected by law or face the stigma around disability. Um, families and community people are not yet accepting of disability in a way that allows people both to value who we are and how we contribute, but also allows um, non-disabled people to recognize that disability is something that anyone can join this family for any reason at any time. When we look at the environment, you know, one of the outcomes of um, our deteriorating environment is an increase in pollution. The increase in pollution is resulting in higher incidence rate of lung disease, of asthma, and other uh, related uh, disabilities. Now, not only do we need to be environmentalists and fighting for rights and for clean air and on and on, but we also need to look more at how we can be reaching out in a timely way to people who are acquiring disabilities and have no idea about the disability rights movement. Or maybe I've heard about it, but don't know who it is. Um, we have 61 million disabled people in the United States. Um, if 5 million of us on a regular basis were speaking up and speaking out, it would have an amazing impact on what was going on. So I think as a movement, we need to be, I mean, we need to live our lives, right? You know, everybody is not going to do everything disability every day. But I think we need very much some of us to continue to be more and more active in what I call the movement. We need to make sure that people in 
our communities, in religious groups if you belong, um, in the workplace, at universities, understand what the laws are, understand how they can benefit us, but also what more we need. You know, as we were talking about home and community-based services, sign language interpreting being more available, um, services for blind people and people with intellectual disabilities, all of that needs to be improved. And I think, you know, Navana, uh, Navina, sorry, Navina, um, when you look at the work that you're doing, in the area of prisons, uh, that is a tremendous area where as a community, we need to be much more involved because we know that there is a disproportionate number of disabled individuals who are in juvenile and adult facilities and people were not getting the support and the services they needed earlier on and then are involved, well, many ways to describe it, but for some people who you know, have committed a crime um, and are winding up in jail, many of those individuals need not be there if they would have gotten appropriate services along the way. And prisons, as you know better than me, um, are not a place in many ways to quote unquote rehabilitate people. So it's a major issue and we need to, and it's a perfect example of how we need to go you know, beyond our areas of knowledge and keep looking for more knowledge. Absolutely. And I think this is a great segue to your vision for the future. So, you know, in light of these challenges and most of the hopes that you're expressing, tell us about the world you envision for future generations of people with disabilities. Well, I envision a world where a we acknowledge that we are a part of a world. I think in the United States all too frequently, we really don't acknowledge the existence of countries outside of the US. While we have many immigrants in our country and um, we as immigrant families understand that there is a world beyond us as a country, we still don't understand the uh, role and responsibility that we have to be working with people in other countries around the world, to support um, efforts to continue to reduce poverty. I mean, one of the things we're seeing with the data coming out on COVID is potentially a big uptake in poverty that we were seeing a reduction in over the last couple of decades. So we need to see that we're not in it just for ourselves, that we are um, a world where we are interdependent. And so when we look at the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which is the UN treaty that came into force in 2008, and there are about 175 countries that have ratified the treaty and we have not yet ratified that treaty. Um, that is something that hopefully uh, when Vice President Biden becomes President Biden, uh, we will be able to look at um, that treaty being ratified. And why I think that's important is we have many good laws in place that others can very much benefit from learning about. And we also have a lot to learn from other countries. Um, we have a lot to share and a lot to learn. So at the end of the day, you know, the world that I want to be living in, um, spikes to the rights of all people in our country and in countries around the world. And we have to respect every person um, where they are. And I, I really can't underscore enough how I really feel like, you know, when I travel and I've traveled a lot in my life, it's really, um, very interesting to see how disabled people in all the Scandinavian countries, in many of the European countries, in Canada, in Japan, Australia, Korea, on and on, know so much more about what's going on globally and um, are so much more engaged. Um, as the US disability community, although we're such a diverse community, 
Um, but we don't really even ask our brothers and sisters from other countries, um, what were some of the needs in your countries? And if you could make a change in X country, what would that be? And what role do you think we should be playing as the US in bringing that change about? Um, so yeah, that's my hope for the future. So thinking about this vision and, and your hope for what the future looks like for people with disabilities in and the US society, and globally. And the society overall. I think and, that's what's really- And overall. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, what are three to five things that people, organizations- Now she's getting her doctorate. Three to five <laughs> Yes, three to five <laughs> or more. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, what are three to five things that people, organizations, and governments can do today to put us on the right path to this vision for the future? And the reason why I'm asking this is I think that we have a tendency to have this very wide sweep in vision that's very, very value oriented. And while that's very good, I think people sometimes need concrete next steps to do something, an action plan, so to speak. And you've had such great experiences. You've done so much. Share that expertise with us. Tell us what you want us to do. Well, I don't, again, I'm sorry we can't be more interactive. Because it's not me telling anybody. I will continue to share experiences. And one of the reasons why I think it's really important to have these discussions is because things change. You know, there are, there are changes that have gone on over my 72 year life. And, you know, experiences that people in your generation are having now that are not the same as mine. Not that we shouldn't be very clearly working collaboratively together, we should. But I think it's also important that we respect everyone's voice and that everyone has something to contribute. Um, so in looking at your question, and I'll, I will talk about voting. And the reason I say that is laws are made by our elected representatives. The courts review litigation um, and elected representatives at the city level, the county level, the township level, the state level, the federal level, you know, our US congressmen, our senators, your state assembly persons and your state senators, your city council people, all of these people are the ones who are involved in the development of legislation and budgeting. If we are not significantly involved, if what we see from our elected representatives is not reflective of what we believe needs to happen, that is a big issue. And I don't wanna say it's our fault, but I do believe that we need to take responsibility for holding people who are in these positions of responsibility accountable. We need to be demanding that they are learning about our issues. And just like with 504 and the ADA, it does mean that we need to be working more collaboratively together within the disability community, but also within other communities. Uh, when I worked at the Berkeley CIL um, in the 1970s, uh, we had had, it was, which was in California, Berkeley, California, there had been, um, a, a state um, law that had been passed, a referendum, which uh, reduced property taxes. And the reduction of property taxes had a major impact on nonprofit organizations. And obviously, particularly groups that were serving disabled minority and poor people. Now, we could have each organization on its own gone off and been fighting for our own budgets. But in fact, what we did was to form a coalition of groups that were nonprofits 
working together so that we were not trying to take money from X group in order to give it to Y group. But we were really looking at the whole and working with the county board to try to come up with a budget that would have the minimal adverse effect across the board. So I think this is something that's very important now um, because we know from COVID there is an impact on budgets, uh, on city budgets, on state budgets, on federal budgets. And again, you know, one of the issues is where is the Senate in relationship to getting a stimulus package together? Um, why are they not voting on a stimulus package, but are putting forward a Supreme Court justice, which clearly they could be doing after the elections and right now voting, you know, on a stimulus package, which is needed. You know, the point that uh, Navina is making is, you know, she feels that we need to have measurable objectives um, so that government and others in agree, I mean, working collaboratively together, um, have, a, have a, um, a path to move forward. And I agree, that's very important. Additionally, I think it, for me, it also means, you know, we're at Fordham, you're all in undergraduate or graduate school, or many of you who are on this uh, Zoom call tonight. Where are you going in your profession? How are you including your disability in the part of the work you're doing? I'm not saying that you have to just do work that solely focuses on disability, but it is important that you bring yourself to your job and that disability, if you have one, or if you know people who do, is something that you bring to the table. It's just like what the women's movement has done, what the people of colors groups have done, is to really help elevate the implementation, the development of legislation, the passage of legislation, the development of rules, the implementation on the day-to-day -day level of the work that needs to be done. You know, life, in my view, is like an onion. And you can pick the section that you want. Education, urban planning, healthcare, media, cinema, whatever it may be. But we will advance further if we look at communities like the LGBT. LGBTQ community, um, the Black movement, et cetera. And when we get into jobs, we are really looking at who are other disabled individuals that we need to be bringing into the world of work. When there are jobs opening, how are we making sure that disabled people know about these jobs and are getting um, applying for these jobs and getting fair interviews for these jobs? And that when people are getting jobs, are they getting the supports they need? Are they able to advance in their careers? And um, to the extent that we really have a good network, it allows us as individuals, when we're experiencing problems, to be able to reach out to a friend and say, this is what I'm experiencing. What do you think? What should I do? Um, it means that affinity groups in government and the private sector are there so that we're not so isolated and alone. I think that's one of the big issues in the disability community that many people feel very alone. They're not acknowledging disability. Um, they're afraid of stigma. They're afraid of repercussions. College campuses, I think, you know, are a real example that students who need additional support, unless they're in a really good environment where it's clear that the university is there to ensure you get the supports you need, that frequently students are saying they're afraid to ask for what they need because they're afraid of repercussions. And I mean, I last year was speaking at an event for the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which has been doing work with disabled scientists, students and beyond for many years. And this student was talking about how, you know, she was majoring, she was taking um, some advanced science class and the teacher came up to her in the beginning and told her to drop out because she was never going to be able to get through the work. So she was very lucky that she basically said no, wound up getting an A in the class. But it was not because of the professor, because the professor really um, treated her completely inappropriately. 
She didn't file a complaint. She didn't say anything because she was afraid of what could happen. So that's like one little example, but these are things that we need to speak up about. We need to be there to help make these changes um, and we need trust. And disability needs to be considered a part of diversity across the board. We need to be speaking up and speaking out and not hanging back. Thank you. So I think we have just a few more minutes. And so I'm going to turn it over now and open it up to the audience for their question. I know we have about seven questions already in the Q&A box. Um, so I'm going to encourage audience, the audience members, if they have additional questions, please start entering them into that box. And I'm going to start going through in the order that they were entered with the exception of the one member whose question I've already answered pertaining to the pandemic and special education requirements. Um, and so the first question, Judy, is how do you think society may, be, may begin to decrease the stigma on invisible disabilities such as mental illness? Um, I'm gonna say one thing about the special ed question and then I'll get to this question, Bridget. Um, I also think we need to get rid of terrible terms like special education. I hate the word special education. Uh, when we use special in the area of disability, it's usually kind of a very negative meaning. Um, and so I think, you know, it's not on the top priority because we wanna be getting kids and adults the educations we need, but we should definitely be looking at getting rid of the word special because special in our case means not positive all too frequently. So Bridget, thank you for your question. And again, I wish we could be having a discussion on what you think society uh, may begin to, how society can help decrease the stigma. Um, so my perspective is we need to listen to people who have mental health disabilities or psychosocial disabilities or whatever it is the individual person might wish to be called. Um, we need to allow people to see that people who have uh, psychosocial disabilities can play meaningful roles in our community. And that many people, um, you know, you look at COVID right now, and we're talking about people having increased anxiety, increased depression, uh, other uh, mental health, disabilities and our inability to speak about this is both harmful to the individual person, to the family and to the community at large. And so I think like with each uh, category of disabled people, we need to normalize this. We need to really um, allow people from the voices of disabled people ourselves to talk about our disabilities um, to talk about what it is that we need, to learn about the contributions that we are making, and to really get people who are, um, who currently have in this case, psychosocial disability, and who are working in many different levels of jobs and active in our communities, we need to be able to support them so they can come out and speak about it without fear of repercussions. We need to strengthen services in our community. Um, so, and we need to strengthen self-help groups. I mean, I think one of the, that when I lived in California, they were, um, and I was working, you know, at the Center for Independent Living. Um, when I came to Washington, I was no longer, you know, working at the grassroots level, but at the national level. But when I was living in Berkeley, there were, there was a growing uh, movement of people who themselves had psychosocial disabilities, peer support groups that were being set up, advocacy, and you know, there's certainly this effort continuing throughout our communities. So respect the voices, listen to the voices, ensure that we're doing what we need to do, where opportunities um, are there and we can be inviting and including people in, that people are included with a broad array of disabilities uh, we, and really, I think the ability to 
share appropriate stories, not all negative stories, and allowing people to understand. As I was saying, as an example, in the juvenile justice system, we shouldn't call it justice, in the juvenile system, um, the causes of people winding up in, in youth facilities, um, in adult facilities, and what we need to do as an example to address those problems. But it needs to be led by people themselves who have psychosocial disabilities. Um, the former director of the, Ameri of the, of the association AUCD, the Association for University Centers on Disability, um, is bipolar and he's now heading up a legal organization in California. And he's always spoken up about his being bipolar. And I think that's always been really very important because other people then feel like they can speak up and he can be supportive and appear. But most importantly, it's allowing people the space and giving people the protections that they need. Thank you, Judy. Um, the next question, and I ooh, just before we get into the next question, I wanted to clarify that we have Q and A with the audience until seven fifteen. And so when I said we had a few more minutes, I just meant I concede the last three minutes of my section <laughs> with Judy to the audience. Um, <laughs> But <laughs> um, but so I yield my time there. But uh, let's. This next question is an interesting one. I think it's about the optics of the 28 days, um, and how the Black Panther Party and Salvation Army supported them. And the person clarified that the context for this question is that you mentioned the 28-day occupa occupation of the Hugh Building in, Sa in San Francisco. Um. OK. Um, so I suggest a couple things. Mm -hmm. um, I will talk about this now, but I suggest a couple things. One is you look at Crip Camp, um, which you can see on, as um, Jonathan was saying earlier, uh, you can see it on YouTube, and if you have Netflix, you can also see it there. On YouTube, you can see something called The Power of 504. And The, the Power of 504, excuse me as I get hiccups, um, The Power of 504 only, um, it's a documentary about 18 minutes, and it focuses just on the demonstrations um, uh, before and during the health education and welfare takeover. Um, Crip Camp is a much broader story. So if you want to dig deeply just into um, the optics of 504 demonstrations, uh, look at the power of 504 also. And um, I wish Lynette, who's one of the sign language interpreters, could in fact speak at this time also because I met Lynette in 1977, and it's really a very funny story. Lynette, can you turn your camera on at least? Um, so she can't step out of her role as interpreter, but I can. Um, it's a very funny story because uh, Lynette had just come from New York to the Bay Area, and we had a gentleman who was acting as an interpreter we had not planned as a group to uh, take over or to, to basically uh, have a 28 day demonstration in living in the building. Um, it, it, that's a longer discussion, but the bottom line is it, it grew exponentially um, after the first day because all of the other regions in the United States where there were demonstrations had basically fizzled out and so the Bay Area, which was really the most organized at that time, um, we had the most cross-disability group and support, as I was saying, for many others. Lynette arrived in San Francisco. She was looking for a job. Joe, who was the main interpreter at that point, had to go meet his boyfriend at the airport and contacted Lynette to get her involved. So that's how Lynette got involved, both in the 504 demonstration and I think in the cross-disability movement. 
uh, because Lynette um, is a coda, meaning her mother uh, was deaf, and so she's a child of a deaf adult. But she was really learning about the movement. And I, I think, you know, her story, if you can ever get her to tell you, is very meaningful because, you know, she came into the building as an interpreter, uh, meeting everybody for the first time. And uh, really, I think, you know, can express herself, you know, the changes that were going on in the building with the deaf community and the deaf community and other disabled individuals. I think that's a very important part of what went on during the demonstrations. It was a real opportunity for people who came together supporting the signing of the 504 regulations, but also learning about each other in a way that most of us didn't know about each other before, both with physical disabilities and blindness and deafness and mental health disability, intellectual disability, parents, children, it was kind of an across the board. Now, these other organizations that got involved, like the Black Panthers, so one of the reasons why the Black Panthers got involved is one of the people involved in organizing the demonstration was a gentleman named Brad Lomack. And Brad had multiple sclerosis, and Brad was also a member of the Black Panthers. And so he was the one that reached out to the Panthers, and he was the one that was able to get the Panthers to come and begin to provide food for the increasing number of days that we were there. The Salvation Army and um, many other organizations also were very involved in many different ways. And it really, um, it was not only a community in this building, but because we were getting reasonably decent media coverage um, and because there was a gentleman named Ed Roberts, who some of you may know, was uh, one of the leaders in the disability rights movement. And he had become the director of the Department of Rehabilitation in California. He had good contact with other directors of other agencies in California at the state level and the governor. And so we got mattresses from the State Department of Health and all kinds of things that typically, you know, you wouldn't be seeing. The mayor of San Francisco was calling over to the White House to try to get various things and was told by the Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare that he wasn't running a hotel. But, you know, you just saw all this amazing collaborativeness and a group of about, I don't know, 25, 30 people left the building from San Francisco and went to join people in Washington, D.C. Um, to continue the demonstration. The people in San Francisco stayed in the building. Lynette was one of the people who joined us in uh, Washington, D.C. So, you know, we had this, in some way, ragtag group of disabled individuals that um, were really, you know, gaining strength and confidence. Uh, because we were seeing that when we were well organized and we were doing something beyond the disability community, that there was a real interest in making this happen and that we could take this ragtag group from San Francisco and join up with people in Washington, D.C. and really make a difference. So I think those are all very critical parts about the story. That's, that's such an awesome story. Um, and I love that you and Lynette have this long standing relationship. I think a lot of us with disabilities have known people who work with us for such a long time. The, I'll go ahead and share that the captioner that's working with us tonight, I've known her for over 10 years. She has been, she was my captioner at Fordham. Um, so a shout out to Lauren Schechter, who's the captioner tonight as well. Um, next on the questions is, uh, so this person would love to know how you and others got idea passed and uh, the person is interested in your views about the degree to which it is being enforced. And from the stories that the person hears, Many students are being educated in the most restrictive environment rather than the least. Special ed, in quotations, 
still seems to be used as a clearinghouse for kids with all kinds of disabilities who could learn at advanced level. So um, I appreciate and agree with the sentiment behind this question. Um, so I guess, you know, when I look at IDEA, I have to discuss a couple of parts. One is um, I didn't benefit from the IDEA because it didn't exist when I was going to school. When I went from Brooklyn to California, I um, got involved with the Center for Independent Living, but I also went to graduate school at Berkeley in the School of Public Health. And as part of my requirement, I had to do a six month placement. And just coincidentally, Senator Harrison Williams, who was one of the US senators in New Jersey, and I was the head of the um, Labor and Public Welfare Committee, which had education under it and, and the Rehab Act under it, they were looking for a legislative um, assistant, which was a junior position. Um, and an old boyfriend of mine knew the woman who was looking uh, and gave them my name and I got interviewed and Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley said, I could do my placement in Washington. And I ostensibly went there for six months and then stayed for a year and a half before I came back to Berkeley and, and graduated while I was um, working in the Senator's office. Um, I, the, the legislation at that point, the what was called the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, uh, was definitely moving forward, uh, was being led by uh, senators and congressional people and their staff. When I got there, there were drafts of the bill. And so the role that I played at that point was, you know, working with the other leadership and giving them uh, real examples of what was going on in the area of education with disabled kids for what wasn't going on and the importance of parents and the role of parents. That was the first real voyage in that area. But then when I um, was the assistant secretary for the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services, there were three offices under me and uh, the director of special ed was a man named Tom Hare. Um, and we had responsibility for both oversight of the IDEA and then there was something called the reauthorization. So the bill was up to make changes in that law to um, iron things out and to strengthen it. Uh, one of our major areas of responsibility was enforcement of the law, uh, which Tom and I both believed in very strongly. And I would say that one of the issues around enforcement, there are many issues, but one of them is insufficient staff to be able to do the kind of monitoring and technical assistance. Because I think it's not just um, identifying problems, it's really working on solutions. Um, I also think that state agencies um, for you know, state departments of education who have responsibility for enforcement of the federal law at the local level um, are not doing a good enough job in many cases. And so it really needs to be a partnership. Uh, local school districts need to understand what their responsibilities are. And additionally, I think this is a very, this is not just a disability issue, uh, but budgets, the amount of money that's going into education. I think, you know, we are not spending as a country, as a state, as local communities, the amount of money that needs to be spent on education for non-disabled children and for disabled children. And I think that's something that we critically, even in the middle of what's going on now, that's one thing that we need to be working in coalitions at the federal, state, and local level to really demand more money going into budgets um, that are educating children, including children with disabilities. And um, that is not something which is easy. I think, you know, I've not been a big supporter of charter schools because I, I believe that we should be making reforms in the public schools so that 
kids are going to public education. Too many kids are not getting served or served appropriately in the charter schools and they're pulling money away from the public schools. So, um, but I think I would say budgeting, but I also really believe that our universities are not training teachers uh, to be able to work in classes with diverse learners. And now I'm not just talking about disabled kids, but for the purposes of this question, disabled children. So students are graduating with their degrees in education. And all too frequently, if you ask these students who are now teachers, um, did you learn what you needed to learn in order to be able to work um, in an inclusive setting? Um, do you know how to make accommodations to math and science and English and whatever the subjects may be? All too frequently, these teachers are saying they don't. And that I believe is both the responsibility of the universities as well as the state governments really putting greater demands that teachers that are being trained need to come out being able to work in the classrooms of today. And again, I'm saying it's not just for disabled kids, um, but obviously disabled kids is a meaningful part of what we're discussing. So better enforcement. Oh, and one other thing I'd like to say, and that is technical assistance. So one, I believe, you know, we have these, or many maybe don't know this, but there's a provision in the law about parent training information centers, which I believe are very important because these PTIs, as they're called, um, these are the organizations that are supposed to be working with families who have disabled children. These are the organizations that <laughs> are supposed to be helping families learn about the law, learn about what their rights are, um, learn about what school districts should be doing that they maybe aren't doing, being able to be supportive of families, um, going to an IEP meeting, et cetera. Um, so I think, you know, we're talking about technical assistance. We're talking about stronger parent training programs. We're talking about better programs in universities for teachers and for supervisors and for principals and superintendents. We're talking about our local school boards. Who are the people that you're electing? Do you even know you have a local school board? Do you know you're electing people? the local school board? Do you know what their positions are? Are they fighting for you and for your kids with disabilities? It all gets to me back to voting and knowing our, the people who are running for office and being more demanding and working collaboratively together. Thank you. So I'm looking through the questions and I want to Skip to the last one that we received about global uh, disability rights. And I also will respond to some of you um, regarding the meeting, but I will just say that this will be posted on YouTube for those of you asking about that question, um, or asking that question rather. Um, the question is, can you share your thoughts about how the, the disability rights movement can be promoted globally? in low-income countries. Um, this particular individual is from China, and when she, I believe this is a she, when she saw the power of 504, felt strongly that China is ready to move forward. Um, as a country, China rat ratified um, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. However, the execution of policy is very distorted from the disability rights movement. Many people with disabilities still hold strong internalized stigma against disability. So the question is, how did disability identity become a collective identity back then? And then what can we learn in China? Okay, so thank you very much. I've been to China a number of times. And um, yes, there are changes that are going on in China um, that are benefiting disabled people. Um, there's still a lot more that needs to be done. I would say that it's critically important that the U.S. ratify the CRPD so that we can play a meaningful role um, in the U.N. as a part of things like the Conference of State Party meetings, where disabled people in governments 
typically get together once a year um, to really uh, meet and talk and do workshops, et cetera. But there are organizations, you know, there is a group called the International Disability Alliance. It has offices in Geneva and in New York, IDA, International Disability Alliance. Um, that is an organization that would be well worth it for people to look at because it's an organization that represents 13 international disability run organizations. It also represents um, a number of regional, off, regional organizations like the African Disability Forum. Um, and so there are lots of groups now that have been uh, developing, run by the disability community um, in countries all around the world. And that is really um, very positive. And I think there are diaspora groups here in the United States. And if you belong to any of these diaspora groups, you know, whether or not they are including disability, not in a charitable way, but in a rights-based way, I think that's very important. And, you know, I have some friends that are a part of a number of different, different uh, diaspora groups uh, from different countries in Africa. I think that's you know very important that they're working collaboratively uh, with disabled people in their countries. Um, but there are groups there are groups out there that are doing international work, and as I said, groups within the country. And maybe you know if if you've got some uh, specific issues, you could raise them with Sophie, uh, Professor Mitra, and we could I could also look at trying to help you get some more connections. But there's some very good work. In the US, there's a group called the United States International Council on Disability. There are quite a number of groups in the United States that are doing domestic and international work. A group called Mobility International USA, which is based in Oregon, a group called the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, based in California. Uh, as I said, the United States International Council on disability, which is based in uh, Washington, DC. And then their Human Rights Watch, which is, has an office in New York. They have about 10 staff that are dedicated to working on uh, disability in the human rights context. Uh, they've just launched this campaign called Breaking the Chains, which is looking at the issue of shackling of disabled people in countries around the world where people are literally being chained, living in cages uh, because of lack of services on and on. There's quite a lot of work going on, not enough, but I would say, you know, especially for those of you who are in New York, there are a lot of opportunities. Thanks, Judy. So this individual says, you're such an amazingly clear, direct, accessible speaker on disability subjects. I see it from your Crip Camp days through to this moment. Do you have advice for the rest of us how we can speak out about disability and social justice more generally without being divisive or alienated? Yeah, this is where we need a dialogue, guys. It's like, you know the answer. You got to do it. And I think doing it in conjunction with other people, you know, looking at what you're trying to achieve, um, setting goals and objectives, and going for it. And, um, you know, it may be issue by issue. It may be something longer term. You know, for me, for those of you who are students at Fordham or CUNY or wherever you may be going or graduate school, undergraduate school, or alumni, whatever, um, I think, use these opportunities to come together and to brainstorm, to look at what's going on on your campuses. Are you getting the services that you need? Are you being blown off by the university saying it doesn't have an obligation? And if that's happening, what are you doing? How are you working with other minority groups on campus? Um, you know, I know that you're not on campus now, but you will be many of you, you know, at the end of next year, whatever, um, take advantage of this. 
have your disability studies courses obviously give you information on the history of disability rights, but don't be passive. You know, this is your time. As I said, when I was in college, I was working with friends on setting up the disability services offices. Now, you probably have them because I don't know any universities or community colleges that don't anymore, but some of them are excellent and some of them are not. And if you're in a school where it's not what you want it to be, then you need to sit down with the leadership of the school. But before you have that meeting, you need to be able to sit down and talk about what is not happening that you believe is important. Maybe look at another university or two, to give examples, but don't let that be holding you back. But remember, you know, college, university is an opportunity for you to explore many things and speaking up and expressing yourselves and really engaging in discussions where you're trying to bring about change. That's very important. And also, you know, many of you are doing community work, all kinds of things while you're in school. You need to be asking, you know, where where is representation of disabled people? What needs to be done with whatever you're doing? You know, it's like, take advantage, look at what you think is going right and wrong. Um, you know, you know, the issue of, you know, respectful. And of course, I believe, you know, that it, it really being respectful of other people is valuable. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I shut up what I'm going to say. It means that I have to learn how to say what I believe in. And, um, you know, depending on the response from the other side is how I respond back. And you can see that when you look in the movies and the book and look at what other people are doing. People need to see that we're no longer begging for change. People need to understand that we are demanding the change that the laws in this country have given us the right to demand. And you know, usually it's the affected group that has to be coming forward and saying, this is not working. We're here to help you make it work. Um, and if not, we're here to help you make it work. Hold on one second. This is my husband. <laughs> Hello. It's 150, 70 people. Oh, hello, guys. <laughs> Dinner time. Okay. So I think we only have about five minutes left. Um, and I just wanted to end maybe briefly with this one question um, from one of the participants um, with just a little bit of reflection from you, Judy. Um, I know we gain, I know with age, we gain knowledge. Is there something you wish that we can, that you can go back and tell your younger self? What did you learn on your journey that could have helped you when you first started out? Um, huh. I mean, I think, um, in some way, I feel like, you know, you're learning incrementally. And um, if we could have had a stronger movement earlier on, that would have been very helpful. But I feel pretty much like, um, being more, well, a lot of it, for the reason I'm hesitating, is a lot of it is the need to have knowledge, uh, the ability to really bring people together to be stronger advocates. I think that's really, you know, I think about New York City and 
these um, modifications that were made to train stations and a new museum that opened up and library and things like that where they're not accessible or not completely accessible. And I'm like, how could that happen? And so I think the question is, um, we all need to not lose sight of the fact that certain things like construction, uh, we've got to be diligent because if things get constructed, whether it's housing or transportation or um, uh, the internet or very, you know, websites, whatever it may be, any time that we have to go back in, a retraining of teachers, any time we have to go back and try to do something, it's going to be more money and more expensive. So, I guess you know, being even more vigilant and more uh, being stronger in being able to um, continue to fight for changes is one thing that um, maybe would have been good to be able to do more of. But I really think, you know, it's a process. And um, it's not only what I could have told myself differently, but it's what, when we look intergenerationally, how we can be working together. I think that's really, you know, the importance of learning from what people have done not necessarily repeating how you make the changes because times change and there are many different ways of doing things, but really uh, keeping a vision, uh, which is intergenerational and recognizes the breadth and depth of what we need to do. Thank you so much, Judy. I am always so in awe of you. I always love spending time with you. It's always such a pleasure. Um, I want to take this last couple of minutes that we have together to thank you for your time, for being with all of us here, um, to thank Fordham for sponsoring this, for hosting this lovely event, to Dr. Mitra, to Dr. Crystal for kicking us off, and to our wonderful ASL interpreters, Lynette and Nicole, and finally to our wonderful captioner, Lauren, for their wonderful accessibility tonight. Um, thank you all for joining us. It's been a real pleasure having you and a good, have a really lovely night and stay safe, everyone. And I wanna thank you, Naveena, you are great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Hope next time we meet in person. Bye, thank you. Bye, good night. Good night.